Hey, what's going on, peeps? All righty, all righty. Hey, I'm excited for today because uh, I'm going to bring in Justin here. Because look, we're going to talk about Bant. Justin left a comment, I think it was on his profile page, and I was just obnoxious and said something, I think, about Bant and pricing and how important all that stuff is, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, you guys know how I feel. I'm, this Bant needs to go away. You need to put to bed. It's done. It's wasted. And, you know, Justin challenged me, and he challenged me pretty well. So because he challenged me well, I thought, you know what? I need to help him out. Um, although I'm seeing a problem with my – here, let me see. If you guys can see me all right. Oh, there I come back. Hopefully you can see me. I didn't lose you. All right, so let's bring in my man. Hold up, hold up. I am not doing a good job today. It, not doing a good job. Let's bring my man in. Let's get this. Let's get this party started. And boom, we should be live. There we go, baby. What's up, Justin? How you doing? How are you, Keenan? I've been I've been following your stuff. I want to say ten years for sure. I I feel like a sales guy. I think I've been following the blog. Could it be twelve or fifteen? Is that even possible? So the blog started in two thousand nine. Okay, so that's possible. Yes, it's possible. <laughs> So yeah, I've been cheering from the sidelines. I've been really stoked. Um, I love how you published indie. You sold a ton of your books. I've been trying to go through Legacy Publisher. It's been a slog. I um, talked to Aaron Ross about this. I mean, to each their own. It's a great publisher. Love them. But I just love the groundswell you've been, built around Gap. And a lot of people in my community love Gap selling. And um, it's just an honor to be on the show. It's the first thing I wanted to say. Thank you, baby. All good, man. Look, I, I'm, I'm like traditional publishers have just torqued me because everybody told me no. And I, and there, in my opinion, there was no valid in their head. There was valid reasons, but I was watching them publish my peers books. And some of these peers are my friends, you know what I'm saying? And, and I had been, I, look, I've been, I didn't, I'm not, I just came on the scene. I didn't just come on the scene. I've been blogging for years, but yeah. every criteria they use, like, oh, it's just another book and this. I'm like, all right, fuck you. Fuck you. I'm going to do it myself. And we're, we're coming up on, we're going to be promoting the shit out of this, but we're coming up on 50,000 books sold. That's huge. And just for the record, it's not 50,000 books that we sold them at $1.99. You know what I'm saying? Or gave them away. We, it's been $27.99 for the hardcover. It's 18 bucks for the soft cover. And so, and we're still coming on 50,000 books. So the lesson in this one, I always think of Aaron Rodgers, right? Being drafted at like number 28 when he's supposed to go one. Or Tom Brady, 199. Fuck <laughs> the experts, man. Fuck the experts. They don't know what the fuck they're talking about. They just play a game. They spread the wealth and maybe they get lucky once in a while. So yeah. anyways, I... You can tell I'm bitter. <clears throat> it worked out. Yeah, so many things to say about that. I'm a proud owner of the book. Um, so yeah, I, I love I love the hustle. I just love um, you know how much energy you're always putting out. I'm definitely setting a benchmark for um, good provocative content too, which is key because I feel like SaaS. This is weird. SaaS has been around for 20 years. Like cloud and software as a service. 2002 at Cisco and Salesforce at 50 million run rate, and we're almost at 20. Mm -hmm. You know, 2022, not much has changed really. The SDRAE game and the, the way things are managed and run. There's, and we're talking today about obviously the sales process, but there's there's a lot that's very similar to 2002. It's, it's shocking. <laughs> you know, look, what I always say is the the sales process, like selling, hasn't changed. It's a it's a psychological, it's a human to human thing, right? Like yeah. Pete said, it's to sell is human. But even though that hasn't changed, it shouldn't have changed. We keep trying to tweak things and mess with things and some work and some don't. The tool world is different and the structure world is different, but you know, selling is still the same. You got to yeah. influence someone to buy. You got to influence somebody to buy. So all right, I think everybody said you can see me, although my thing sucks. Um, we got a good group. All right, man. So talk to me. Why? Let's just jump right in, dude. Another platitude's making me feel good because I'm going to shred you. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> why do you think... Um, why do you think that Bant matters? Like, why do you think Bant matters? And why do you think price matters as a qualification tool? Yeah. So um, I've heard a lot about the death of Bant or I saw Aaron, um, not Aaron Ross, but Mark Roberge build GPCT, which is like goals, plans, challenges, timeline, and things like Medic. But I actually like Medic because of economic buyer. I still believe it's important, even if the stakeholders don't understand the buying process or the budget, I feel like there's something psychological about breaking the ice on the commercials earlier rather than later. And I probably scorch the earth. It's just my personal style to anchor high. I like to make people uncomfortable by talking about millions of dollars. My goal is to sit with an executive and we're going to look in the eye calmly and I'm going to bring up $1 million and watch their emotional read. And mm -hmm. that's, it's a, you know, it's, Maybe it's a little dominant, but I'll tell you, um, 
You know, I have sat with some of the most senior executives in the Fortune 1000, and in that moment, they needed to find out about mobile analytics, and I knew more than them about my subject. So I never shied away with saying, if we fully partnered, this is the commercials, because honestly, they would look me in the eye and say, what's it going to cost? They didn't want me to hem and haw. And for me, it earned respect. Mm -hmm. that at least I would say, well, if you fully implemented all of it, this would be. I've had experiences where this has backfired. I was in a boardroom. I put up $1.2 million. He goes, if you say that number again, you need to leave the room right now. So it has, it has really, I've been really brave in talking about the money ever since I read Challenger Sale in that, in that aspect. So maybe it's an advanced technique I'm debating because if someone who's just starting in sales starts coughing up numbers, it's going to probably be, it's going to backfire. But I do hope the people I train eventually get really comfortable about talking about the commercials early in the conversation. And that's the B and Bant and the E and Medic, and that's that budget and that commercials and pull it hey, from market. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a yeah. question. I, what do you do for a hobby? Uh, I well, okay. I I like a jazz. I used to be a musician. I play guitar. Hey, okay, good, 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 good. Okay, you're a musician. What do you play? I play guitar. I, I used okay, to. You own a guitar. I do. <laughs> what kind of guitar is it? A Martin guitar. Okay, how much is it? I think the one I have is like a thousand bucks. I don't have oh, a, no. a thousand dollars for a guitar. Well, that's a, not a nice one. I mine used to always be more than you know five or ten. I had really five nice. Or, money. Okay, five or ten thousand dollars for a guitar. Okay. Yeah. Listen, man. <laughs> Listen. That was not a lot for you when you at the time when you're doing it all the time and you were playing all the time and whatever. That was not a lot, correct? It was hard actually at the money, but I justified it because I was playing it five hours a day. You know, you're right. It was, it's like ski gear, right? If you get, like, I know you compete or not compete, but you're very involved with all the ski stuff and that's not cheap, but you're, you're up on the mountain, you're involved. So it's so prevalent that you can amortize the cost. Like to me, if I'm only playing guitar every day for five hours, I don't mind saving for a really nice one. Um, okay. A really nice one. Mind saving. Now watch this. If you're in intermediate guitar so back in the day when you had could play a chord right you could play enough to make it to impress a girl right get her excited whatever <laughs> but you couldn't really jam and, and really impress anybody right and you walked into a store and or someone called you up and said here here's a guitar five thousand dollars what are you doing what are you doing uh, yeah I, w I wasn't ready to do that my first guitar ah, I think John, you just you just basically proved why bent fucking is a waste because you don't know enough at that point in time, that's probably exactly when you needed the $5,000 guitar, when you wanted to transition from being just a guy who can play a few chords to being able to rip it up in a band or, or, or accomplish some XYZ goal. Yep. And new guitar was going to provide the sound. Look, I don't know enough, but I'm guessing. Provide the sound and whatever a great guitar does. And yep. so once you, under, once you understood for yourself what you wanted to accomplish, the fact that you wanted to elevate your guitar playing capability, that you wanted to be in a band or whatever it is, I should have asked you all these questions. But once you realize that's where you wanted to go, all of a sudden that five grand isn't that expensive, is it? Correct, yeah. That's the problem with leading with the price before you understand the future state and the current state. The person doesn't have the context right. of value. And that's the problem. I, I don't want to have to catch up to somebody. I don't want to literally have to say, here's the price. Like, holy fuck, that's crazy. And have to chase them down with, but wait, what about this? But wait, what about this? But wait, what about this? Now I'm playing catch up if they even let me in the game that long. That's true. Right? So, yeah, I mean, I, I think fundamentally that makes total sense. Um, you know, I, I worked in a very niche uh, environment where, um, I primarily served folks who were spending uh, over $10 million a year on Facebook, um, Instagram, Google, very high ticket buyers. And in a way, we had a very strategic sell sale in that they were pretty familiar with the marketing technology and MarTech spend being quite expensive. So they weren't going to really bat an eye at a six-figure investment because pretty much all the MarTech at that point cost that much. So there's definitely a discovery period where developing the pain and making sure that there was a sufficient enough business case and an ROI. But what I started to find when I started traveling with the top performers um, at Salesforce or at LinkedIn or in these SaaS startup companies, and I don't know if it's niche, is the number one thing that made them the top was their comfort level in discussing the economics. And I have a theory of life. All of life is economics. I read The Economist. Um, my father was a linguist and um, 
I don't believe there's anything else happening except economics. I think free market economics dictates all human systems, uh, even male-female relationship dynamics and all of selling. So I think what really happens is, for me, there's a bravery. If I get in an elevator with Mark Cuban and I beat around the bush and I'm cute, or if I just straight up tell him what I do, what it costs, and I'm deadly overt, there's sometimes a respect level with just brass tacks communication. Now, there's a lot of people who, because of cultural norms and how they were raised, they don't like to do that. So I was kind of struck by in the Challenger sale, I would say like bringing up commercials earlier. It's not necessarily meaning right off the bat. I was, I was talking to you earlier about some cultures and countries where I've seen people literally mm-hmm. start a business call and they're like, what is your wallet share? How much do you want to spend on this? Like from the very front. And I think that can be offensive because you haven't tried to know them, but we're in this age of personalization at scale and platitudes, you know, where you meet someone and you try to do this rapport step. And I, I think the the two things that I encourage in my training is don't build rapport and get to the commercial early, which is okay. completely sacrilegious to the I'm sales. With you. I'm with you on don't build rapport. I'm with okay. you. Rapport's okay. going to come naturally. I'm 100% with you. But he, again, let's think about the concept of commercials. And I also agree with you that you shouldn't be afraid to talk commercials. Okay. Right? But yeah. what gives me the confidence to talk about commercials is understanding the value or as much of the value as I can before I give it to you. So yeah. here's an example. If I if I if I like could you know make you my little bitch and send you out into the world and make you sell water at a thousand dollars a gallon, right? <laughs> And I told you that you had to sell so much in a day, it'd be pretty embarrassing for you to walk up to the average person and say, look, you need to buy my water for a thousand bucks, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, wouldn't it? never it'd would. be horrible, right? But if all of a sudden you found ways, you were able to find all the people who were, who were lost in the desert fucking dying of thirst, <laughs> would you be embarrassed to say this is a thousand dollars? No, because they need it really bad. Yes! Yes! There it is, right there. You just said it because they need it. Because I am not embarrassed to talk commercials when I know you need it. So when we ask people to start talking about fucking commercials too early, you're literally sending them out there with the oh, I can't. I want to say it with their with the blink in their hand, right? Just <laughs> take it out because they don't know if the person needs it. And that's, yeah. that's what forced them to go back to be a product-centric seller because they can't articulate it from a problem perspective. So they, they run back for their life jacket, which is their product, and says, yeah, but it's got this feature and that feature. It can do this and it can do that. And, do, do, do. and that pushes them into a product-centric world because they literally don't understand the problem. So look, talk about commercials. Be ballsy about commercials. But when someone asks me the price, unless they force me and I'll give a range, a big range, I'm like, listen, Tell me what you're trying to accomplish. Let's talk about what's going on. That's my first question. That's my very first question. And then when they tell me what's going on, okay, go. No, no, sorry. So you said something really interesting because I was on the thread of the comment. What struck me the most, and I don't know if I misinterpreted this, is you say in your method, don't even touch commercials the first call. Is that is that true? Or is it like where you put it on the first call? Because I think that's a a radical. I don't the first call unless they force me to. Okay, because that's where I get caught sometimes is I sometimes will, depending on reading the situation, if I feel someone is, you know, I try to, it's got instinct. I'm just asking you, how would, how would I do it? Like I go through the first call and then they turn and they, I create desires somehow. And they're just like, what does it cost? What does it cost? And I just say like, oh, you, then you, be creating desire. you shouldn't be creating desire on the first call unless it's a really transactional sale. Because you told me you're in high end complex shit, right? So high end complex yeah. shit, desire is really hard on the first call. What I want to do on the first call is I want to get the buyer to completely polish off and uncover it and align their entire current state. What the fuck's going wrong? Like okay. you talked about yeah. that, those those marketing people and, and the millions and millions of dollars they spend. If they're thinking about making a change, something is telling me they're not getting the clicks, the pay, the 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 uh, price per clicks they want, or they're not getting the return on ad spend, or or they're trying to penetrate a new ma- like market or something. And then I'm trying to figure out what's the uphill impact of all that. So because of that, what? You can't get into the German market. We haven't moved this product like you want. And we haven't get this this profit margin, whatever. And as I dig into all that, then I start saying, okay, well, what happened? So what? So what you're not getting? You're still getting the decent one. Oh, let me tell you why. Our stock price is this. Or we'll, uh, our, our private equity firm expects this. And, da-da. and so then I got you. Now I got you. So now you're not paying the million dollars you're going to pay me isn't for a better application is because if you don't, the private equity firm is going to pull their funding and you're fucked and you'll spend this to make sure you keep your private equity. <laughs> yeah. No, I, so 
what I like about your technique, um, you know, is I, my big problem is I, I'm 41 now. And by 31, I had the funniest conversation. I like filled out a business plan and this advisor, of this company was Scott Lease. And he read my plan. He's hey, like, Justin, Scott, yeah, I know. Yeah. Scott's like, Justin, you're a great regurgitator of books. Do you ever want to think for yourself? Like your business plan is, seems like a library assignment. Like good job at the city college, you know, sales, like go, why don't you go forth young man and prosper. So I left home, I left LA and I moved to San Francisco, St. Louis, New York, Seattle. And I, I held almost every position on the team um, from inside sales to VP of sales. And it was all very hard. And, but I, I love the idea of spin. I mean, what you're highlighting, what I can really agree with, obviously, is the implication, the need payoff, and going beyond the symptoms to the deeper problems, whether you're thinking like a doctor with diagnostics or you're thinking like a detective, like what you're talking about is you're really peeling into the pain, current state, future state, the gaps, right? I'm trying to understand the method. So if people do make the mistake is they go in, they're brash, they do challenger, they're rude, and then they talk about money. And imagine doing that at a dinner party. You know, yeah. everybody would be like, I hate that guy. You know? like, it's like a Jerry Seinfeld character, like showed up, talked about money. Pretty yep. rude. Yep. So <laughs> look, you nailed it. Look, what I like to try to tell people is this. And it, it, you, I know I, I know you haven't read Gap, correct, right? I'm not done with it. I'm I'm like, I'm in probably the fourth chapter. So I can't oh, say okay. I'm read the whole thing. It's, on my Kindle. it's in process. I'm, I'm not going to miss it. Good. All right, good. It's in progress. Well, look, here's the deal. What I try to tell people, whether it's budget, or authority, or need, or timing, right? All of those depend or are measured based on the value that is perceived by the prospect or the buyer. So if you try to get someone to qualify somebody too early, you're doing it out of the context of the value. So when you ask if someone is budget, for instance, right? Basically, you're saying, have you budgeted for this? Well, Guess what? You know how much shit I bought in the last year that I didn't budget for? Because at the beginning of the year or the beginning of the quarter or the beginning of the month, I didn't think I needed it. I didn't think there was any value in it. And then shit happened and I was exposed to whatever. Oh, I need this. There's value in it. So to, to get someone up front to, or to try to qualify on this idea of budget up front before the value is recognized, it's ridiculous. Because the bottom line is if value is seen, and if value is there, they will find the budget. I do not know how many times I have to tell this to people. They will yeah. find the budget. I literally, our biggest deal in 2020 was at the end of the year. They called us in like May or June and said, hey, we're looking for a keynote in the end of the year. Like, all right, you guys are ahead of the curve, I guess, right? Yeah. That was for a one-hour keynote, right? $20,000. By the end of the whole thing, and we figured out what they want and what was going on, blah, blah, blah. It turned into a six-figure deal that they didn't have budget for. I had to go back to the CFO and the CEO. We we worked with them a little on how we structured it, but they found the money. Yeah. Because they recognized, oh, my God. That's so, awesome. I mean, I want to get – I want to get – that deal. <laughs> Most people would have lost that deal, right? Because they would have been like, oh, they don't have any budget. Do you have any budget? No, we don't have the budget. Okay, call us when you do, right? They would have lost it. Same yeah. thing with authority. You know what I say with authority? This is my favorite one. You're going to love this one. You married? I was. Okay. Well, me too. How? <laughs> right. So, right. So you, let's just say you really like this girl, right? <clears throat> right. And you really, really like her. Now she's the authority. Can we agree with that? Yeah. W women run the world. That's, that's okay. Oh, or if it's a girl, let's flip it. If a girl, she really, really likes a boy, the boy's the authority. He's the decision maker. Can we agree on that? No one else can make, this isn't 18, this isn't, you know, Bridgerton, it's not 1822. No one gets to marry you away, right? So the decision maker is the person. Can we agree? Yeah, totally. Okay. However, if you really, really like this girl and you happen to go to college with her brother, are you going to try to get hook up with her brother and try to hang out with her brother and see if he can help? No. <laughs> I am. If that, I went to college with a brother and we're good friends. Are you kidding me? That's an I, end. I agree with you. Actually, I can see that. So I, you know, that happened to me once. Actually, I, um, I was, um, you know, there was a brother who was a, a baseball player, and I, I once gave him a watch, and it went south. So maybe I'm superstitious on that point. But you're right, philosophically. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like if I don't know the decision maker, I don't have access to the decision maker. Right, influencers. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to a brother and we're hanging. He's cool because here's the deal. If he sees value in me, he's like, wow, Keenan's a really cool dude. I really dig him. I'm going to introduce him to my sister. That's good yeah. to go. I'm not going to literally be like, I don't know her. I have no relationship with her. She's out. I'm out. Like, it, it, that's just stupid. Again, it's all about value. Let's, all about value. 
let's extend the metaphor though. Isn't it the kiss of death if the parents like you though? Isn't that the old? <laughs> <laughs> the no, parents the over the parents, right? You know, <laughs> but the point at the end, well, I'll even go with that. I'd actually play that out even further. It's not who you go to. It's the parents. Someone doesn't see value. So it, at the end of the day, again, it's right. can you establish value? And if you establish value, you don't have to be talking to the authority. You don't have to be talking to the decision maker. Right. Same thing for need and timing. Need and timing is based on value. Yeah. Right. Or the impact. Not mine. So when someone says, oh, do you need this or what's or it's, what's your timing? I can determine timing by finding out the size of the problem. I don't need right. them to tell me what the time is. Well, with time, which, again, that company that I just talked about, they didn't want me to do something until the new year. And it was one hour conversation. By the time we understood the size of the problem, it was like, oh, shit, we need to do this now. <laughs> and we need to invest well over six figures. So my point is, if I had banted, I don't win that deal. Yeah, so I have a question for you. Something yeah. that everyone struggle with, and this is a generality that holds, is like, what the heck is value? Because there's like a, it's like a cacophony of the V word on LinkedIn. I know I'm giving you a setup. I'm like, the fastball down the middle, but that word, it's like the word genius. There's way too many people lab labeled a genius, and there's way too many people who are like, create value on LinkedIn, and then you read it, and it's, it's like fluff, <laughs> like Wonder Bread vanilla. You're like, everybody's mm -hmm. shouting value, and then there's no value. It's the weirdest echo chamber. So with young sellers, with new sellers, or sellers who are trying to take their game, what's the value now in the 2020s? Uh, there's all these weird SaaS products that are like, it's a widget, and, um, and people are like, I can't do the business case. I don't have case studies. We don't have a quantified outcome. I've, I've literally worked with companies that have multi-10 millions of run rate, and they have no quantified outcome. That's like... <laughs> <laughs> but maybe they need to discover it. Like we could help them discover it. So yeah, I don't mean to pivot the whole thing, but this is one of the mysteries is the V word. I've, I've been thinking about this for a couple of years. So I think I talk about it in my book. I know I talk about my training and, and I wish I had my, my um, instructor's guide right in front of me and I'd read it. Cause I actually define this because what you just described is actually something I've recognized a long time ago. And I find it a farce when people run around saying, find the value or just deliver value or whatever. So in simplicity to me, what value is, is value is different from person to person, product to product, experience to experience, situation to situation. Value is an agreement. Value is an agreement. That's what value is. So when you try to talk about this concept of value, before you've uncovered the, the problems and issues and challenges somebody's having, and you've offered some sense of solution to that, there is no value. And so what happens is someone has to say, oh, this is valuable to me. I agree that if I buy this product, this problem will go away. And this problem going away is important to me that I, I'll pay 100 bucks, 50 bucks, 1,000 bucks, $2. And so <coughs> it is valuable to me. Like it's, yeah. it's simply that way. Like you talked really about economics. I thought that was really cool because I've been thinking about something a lot on that, in that vein that is fascinating to me. Look, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a full capitalist. But you hear people a lot, and I want to get political, but it's going to go there kind of, this idea that, you know, socialism is bad and fuck socialism and blah, and we just pure capitalism. Well, capitalism in, is based on supply and demand. Can we agree with that? Yeah. Right? The problem with supply and demand is demand is emotional and psychological. And so because it's emotional and psychological, it is not predictable and it is not efficient. It is not efficient because the idea that a whole bunch of people think uh, a, a, a photo is worth a hundred million dollars. Okay, great. It's worth a hundred million dollars, but the value to broader society, it may not play in that. The fact that people think there's more value in, in let's say, um, uh, I don't want to get on this show because I'll piss a lot of people off, but say there's a more value in, in a product than there is preserving the, the environment. That's, capitalism but that's not necessarily a good outcome for the entire society like capital will, will implode on itself if not checked because it's emotional so where did i go there with that it comes down to your question about value mm -hmm. value is emotional and it's in its subjective and it's in it's a series of micro subjective perspectives that add up to broader holes right yeah. and it's not always good and it's not always bad but it, it's emotional and it's subjective. And so therefore it's an agreement in the moment between the person offering something and the person looking for something that's value. And so therefore you, you can't just say what it is. 
Yeah, I think there's um, inherent flaws with a lot of political systems and economic systems, and a lot of the founders of these systems predicted those flaws, and we're living in a time where these flaws are becoming exposed, and people are going, wait. Uh, <laughs> and um, it's interesting, I think about Sandler as a system. I just always love David Sandler because he's a bit of like, you know, he's just a re he's a rebel in a way um he had this concept of ebs which was equal business stature i'm not a sandler trainer i've been through a lot of different trainings but how do you work with people to feel on equal footing because i feel it's hard for sometimes uh sales development reps i do a lot of sdr work to call up high on senior level executives and sometimes what they do is they stay on social media they don't make phone calls or they just stay at the director level or the vp and they wait to contact the cio or um, the CMO because they're waiting till they talk and there's just sort of this um, fear. And one of the things I found was just the bravery. I always felt like I was making a base jump or jumping off, you know, I'd call a member of the board, you know, and I'm mm -hmm. 27 and I'm just like, okay, if I, if I piss this board member off, like this key account that I have to close to make my number, I'm yeah. deep. Six. So how do you, how do you coach people on that uh, within your methodology? Right back to value, baby. I have a thing that says you're not the customer's bitch. But you have to earn the credibility, right? So what a lot of salespeople do, are unable to do is they're unable to understand the value of the call. So let's, let me put it this way. If, if I use dumb analogies, but they always work. If I know that there is a, a wrecking ball about to go through the penthouse where all of the board members are hanging out, and I call them and say, hey, look, there's about a wrecking ball to come through. Do I have the confidence to do that? Why yeah. do I have to do that? Because I recognize the value in my call to them. Mm -hmm. See what I've done there? I recognize the value in my call to them. If that call's not doing anything for me. There may be downstream effect. They're like, oh, thank you. Pat me in the back. Give me money. But the initial call, the main driver of that call is their well-being, value to them. And so right. what people do not understand is every single call, every single email needs to be structured in a way that it recognizes their value, the value to them. And salespeople don't know how to do that. SDRs don't know how to do that. They have no fucking clue about the business that their product or service impacts, addresses, et cetera, as it relates to that person they're calling. Yeah. It, when I think about you, Keenan, I think that, I don't know this is a service that you provide, but I think everybody wants to channel their inner Keenan. They want to become braver. They want to yeah. become bolder. Um, your volume level is is fine. It's your style. You know, I really like it. Um, uh, but everyone has their own most confident side. Even an introvert has their, that period in their life where they're in the flow. They really understand it. They can convey it and they're confident. Maybe it's they got their product knowledge there. They really understand the methodology and they're not lost now in that psychological interaction. So like what I love about what you do is you're, you have a bold approach. And so how do you transfer this boldness to people that are unsure and through reinforcement and training, they get to the point where they can walk in a boardroom. I remember I had this, um, this manager, I was in New York, I was living in Manhattan and he would say, you need to stand up in front of the board and lead that room and get on stage and, you know, and lead them and, and be the leader. Cause I just come in and I'd sit down at the table. I'm soft spoken and I'm going around and notes on my pad. And it very much changed for me when I'd, stand up and I present some information and I wouldn't, you know, feature dump too much, but I would leave the room and they liked that. They wanted it to be led that way. But how do we transition people to, um, you know, the word aggression and aggressive is gone, but that assertiveness that you have, like as an entrepreneur, right? Like you're fearless, you make your own books, your own consultancy, you're closing these huge deals. It, it's, you know, burn the ships. It's Keenan, you know, like I would like to see sellers be more like that. That's a book I'd love to hear from you or a chapter is the motivation and the psychology to be brave in front of executives. And I think, think for me, the money conversation was one cool way where I would lock horns early and I would find it a way to kind of break the glass and deflate. And I'm sure I scorched the earth. I'm sure, I'm sure I banted and I went early in retrospect, but, um, if you don't ever talk commercials and you, you have, to, yeah, you have to eventually, I'm not saying never. Yeah. Of course you do. The, the big risk I see now is I see people trying to do the free pilot, or if we just get enough people on the freemium, they're yep. going to do it. They're going to come back and do a seven figure deal. And I've never seen a land of expansion wow. in SAS that way, because once you tell them it's free, then you try to even get a hundred thousand. They're like, eh, we'll give you 15, you know, but if you say the full thing, seven figures, well, maybe they'll do a paid pilot. Right. 
still, all of it's still product centric, my man. Like everything yeah. is still product centric. Okay. I don't listen. What people people don't buy the product, they buy the outcome. They buy the outcome. So until I understand what the outcome is versus where they are today, that's the gap. Here's the outcome, what you want to achieve. Here's where you are today. Unless I understand those, I cannot quantify the value. You literally asked the value question earlier, right? So I, I, again, horrible analogy, but they're fucking great. You're, you're 40 years old. I'm just making a situation. You got divorced five years ago. You haven't gone on a date in three years. You didn't have kids in the first marriage. You want kids. You've always wanted kids. Your dad died when you were really young. So the idea of having kids is critical to you. You want to pass on the family legacy, but you work super hard. Um, you haven't met a chick that you've been attracted to in three years. You haven't got lucky in four years, right? And <laughs> you're 41, right? And you want to, and, and you don't want to be 70 when you when your final kid graduates from high school. So look at the gap I just built. Mm -hmm. You are going to be more inclined to pay two, three thousand dollars a month or something for a private matchmaker <laughs> right? than you than you ought to pay fifty bucks for a freaking swipe right. And yeah. all because all because you're you're not buying the matchmaker, you're not buying the swipe right. You're literally buying the outcome of meeting that person tomorrow or in the next three months, as opposed to two more years. Yeah. See, that's that's then you'll pay three grand. But if I had just said three grand for for dating, you'd be like, that's fucking ridiculous. Yeah. So okay. So so one for everyone listening, I am the, the proud father of a. Uh, a, a daughter who just turned six. That has made all the stuff, by the way. <laughs> I know you just made up. It's all good. I'm, I'm not spending it. It's a perfect story. You actually you actually nailed it because back in the day when I used to play music and I was just sort of a, a broke musician and I didn't care. I lived in a loft. I was in my 20s and I was just footloose and fancy free. I was doing telemarketing and sales because sales was the only flexible thing I could do to be an artist. But you're right about the guitar because that guitar, I had nothing in my life that was worth five grand, but I had this guitar and I would find any way I could to save up enough money over time. I'd trade them in. I would get like multiple instruments. I'd barter. And then I finally have the stellar thing because, you know, it's like an audio file. These people with premium audio get the right speaker, the right DJ thing. And so vinyl. So, I mean, you actually um, really put me into the value uh, there. I guess the, so the first call, if you're not running BANT or MEDIC or, you know, there's all these acronyms, what is governing how you're running that call? Greatest question ever, and I know it's in the book. Everybody pay attention. We've lost a few people. We're still going to Listen, people. <laughs> it's really simple, Justin. Does the buyer have a problem that I can fix or we can fix? Okay. Does the customer acknowledge and admit they have the problem? Boom. The customer or prospect want to fix the problem. And then finally, will the customer go on a journey to fix the problem? If you have that, you have from a psychology perspective, from an emotion perspective, from a business perspective, I don't care. It is, that is a bulletproof qualification. I like bulletproof. it. Bulletproof. That's how I do it. I'd love to see that one in a tweet or a PDF. I'm sure you have it. So Scott Lease had the addicted to the process model, which is the same. The, the, the customer, the prospect has to say, I have the problem. How on earth could they ever change if they don't acknowledge that they have the problem? So I love that you, you pinpointed that um, because I do. My mentor, Tony Hughes, he always says that. Oh, really? Yeah, Tony's great. So his biggest thing was the competitors do nothing. You know, like the vast majority of these deals, the customer doesn't actually go to your competitor. You get outsold by the status quo. They just It's just easier to just learn from you, get some free consulting, and then not buy anything. And then like let the sellers dance and consult and just take the consulting and like build it internally or do nothing at all. I mean, that's, I, people are so paranoid. Yeah, we lost. I'm like, I don't think they bought anyone. Like you, you both lost, right? You all so went the in. Reason, the reason that happens, and, and, and I've said this, and it's actually one of my, what I feel is one of the most profound things I've said in the last year, and it's getting no play because I just think it's too complex for people to process. Traditional salespeople who are product centric, right? What they do when they're done selling is they put the buyer into a position where the buyer has to do two things at the same time. Determine they want to change and decide they want to buy your product. You're literally asking them to do those things at the same time. And so simultaneously, they come to the end and they're like, you know what? We're not going to buy your product. We're not going to do anything. So now you're screwed. What I've taught people is, and is when you do the product, the problem centric selling, and you do the four things I just said, before you even talk about your product or even the commercials in most cases, is you simply get them to a place that they have to say, you know what, this is untenable. 
Our current state is untenable. It is intolerable. We have to change. Then, then you've got half the battle done. You've got them to admit they have to change first. Then you start talking about what they should change to. Don't try to do them together. That's a shit show. That's why everybody loses the status quo. I can tell you probably on one hand in all the selling the sales guys done we, that we've lost, how many times we've lost to the status quo. Like literally, we either lose the deal to another competitor or we win it because we get the buyer to a place where they're like, yeah, this is not okay. We need to change because we do such a thorough job at, at ripping the current state apart. You read in the book, there's five elements of the current state, right? We find the physical and literal. We find the problem. We find the impact. We find the root cause and we find the emotion. And we then define everything. We define it all, right? Define the whole thing. So when we're done with that, and we're like, well, where do you want to go? And they describe it, and there's the size of the gap. They're like, yeah, okay, we can't continue to do this. And if they try to pull that shit, you come back and say, hey, I'm confused. You said you were losing $2 million a month. You said the private equity firm is going to not give you the next round of funding. Or you said that you're, you, you can't cover the churn because – the salespeople can't sell at a 30% clip because you churns at 20%, whatever. You said, I'm confused. Why are you going to continue to let that happen? Yep. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, a lot of times the building, the business case that we were building uh, in those environments was based on um, advertising fraud. We have te technology to prevent an amount of fraud. And I remember this awesome conversation where I did it. one of the biggest deals is like, you know, uh, my C-levels love me. I can buy all the, the widgets and gear I want. And, and they, he had all the gear. I mean, he had, you know, a million dollars in uh, technology. And I said, well, 50% of every dollar you're spending is on advertising fraud. Why, why don't you impress your C-levels with reducing all this money that you're burning <laughs> by preventing the fraud and making, you know, greater margin and having a better return on investment because you're, you're getting real clicks and real ads. And it was amazing because every vendor in the industry was hitting up this company. Cause I think like Jeffrey Katzenberg was on the board or something and that flip to, to the, uh, a different value, like reducing risk or um, preventing the fraud got me all the way into their boardroom, all the way up to the president, all the way to the board, driving a different narrative than just oh, the real problem. Awesome. Yeah. Like it's wasted money. Of course it did. Of course yeah. it did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. That's what that's what gap selling is about. Finding that—that's a problem. Yep. Well, I know we only have about five more minutes. I think of the original invite. I don't want to. Um, no, man. I think we're good. Hey, no, hey, folks watching, who's got a question? Any of you have a question on here that we didn't address in the next minute? I'm looking at you. I'm looking at the stream. Um, did I convince you guys that Bant is a joke? Like, get rid of Bant. Sorry, medic. I know it's all. These medic people up there, sorry, stop, just stop. Now, I will say this. Eventually, over time, you have to figure out if they, they have to get budget or you have to have a, uh, a conversation on commercials. Eventually, over time. Eventually, over time, you finally have to get to the authority. I got it. Because if I'm going to grow with the, the, you know, my friend's sister, eventually, he's got to introduce me to his sister. And eventually, she's got to see the value in dating me. So eventually, but not in the beginning. I'm not going to disqualify for that. Eventually, they, they, we have to identify a need. Well, I can do that through the discovery and get them like, okay, I need to change. I need a product, but I need to change, and then I can get there. And then finally, timing. Timing is a direct result of how long someone's willing to live with the problem. Like, guys, that, I mean, that's the simplest one in the world. So when you want timing, you better get them to see the cost of not changing or the cost of changing slowly and ask them, can you live with this? Can you live with 50% fraud for another quarter or four quarters or six quarters? What's the impact and why is that livable? Why are you willing to? And then you'll figure out the timeline. I don't need any of that up front. None of it, none of it, none of it, none of it. So take Medic, take Bant, take ABC, LOQS. I don't give a fuck what it is and cut it out. Just cut it out. Simply get to, is there a problem that we can fix? Does the buyer admit there's a problem? Does the buyer want to fix the problem? And finally, will the buyer go on a journey with you to fix the problem? If you have those four things, my friends, you have an absolutely qualified opportunity that's absolutely bulletproof. And now it's your job to get it the rest of the way. There you go. Well, I'm not going to fully admit to but I, I love going, I love going at it with you, Keenan. And I, you have my respect and I, I really uh, enjoy your stuff. I'm going to read gap selling and, uh, Start rethinking some of this stuff. I really love your qualification framework. I'd love to see that written down, and I would love to share that in one of my updates to LinkedIn because I thought it was unique and cool. Um, that's you. what I thought. I did my best, man. I, I uh, 
I'm a bit of a pacifist. I uh, I can't get as loud as Keaton, but I tried to I tried to go toe to toe a little. <laughs> good work. You did good work. Listen, man. You you asked about. I'll I'll leave this too. I, I sit and I'll give you loud word after this. But you asked a question I didn't answer very well, and you asked about the idea of how do people have big personalities or command the room and stuff like that. And and I don't believe you need to. Like I tell people all the time, don't be me, be you. And one thing, you know, not many people actually see me do sales calls, but I'm usually not this loud. I'm much more tempered because my approach is to understand. So I ask questions. I say, hey, can you help me understand? Could you walk me through? I'm confused. Could you share this with me? Could you share that with me? Now, I have fearless curiosity. I'm not afraid to ask really difficult questions that are going to help me understand their environment. But I'll ask a fearless question. But what I want people to understand is, you don't have to be loud. You don't have to be aggressive. You don't have to try to command the room. You can command their respect and earn credibility through your knowledge. So I like to say, sort of like Muhammad Ali said, he said, look, the fight isn't won under the bright lights, right? The fight is won in the, in the sweaty gym when I'm working hard and blah, blah, blah. It's won, it's won long before I get under the bright lights in front of the crowds. Same thing with sales. It's not how much research you do about that company before, and which is not bad, but it's really how much time you spend understanding the problem. Mm -hmm. How much do you know about the problems that your product or service solve? How much do you know about the impacts that has on all the different divisions, all the different um, participants, the users, the management, mid-management, the board? How do those problems manifest themselves? Where do they impact their ability to compete? What are the root causes, right? What are the root causes of those problems? What are the unique elements and root causes that 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 fester inside an organization that caused those problems to exist in the first place. When you understand all of that, like a doctor, and you get a prospect on the phone and you start asking questions that make them realize, holy shit, this person knows my space. They know yeah. all not now. Nah. You don't need to yell. You don't need to be a big personality. You can be quiet and calm and cool like a freaking yogi. And they're still going to be like, I want to listen to you. Awesome, man. I love I loved the session. Let's do another one again soon. Unfortunately, I got I to gotta run because uh, something I'm doing is working, but uh, you yeah, can help me do better. We'll talk really soon. All right, bro. Be good. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Keenan. Likewise. All right. All right. All right, everybody. I'm out. I'm out. I hope this was helpful. I hope you guys stop using Bant. No more Bant. I'm tired of Bant. Okay? Until Oh, now, hey, another hour and a half, 12 o'clock Eastern, I'm doing a kicking it with Keenan. I'm going to have three different people on. I'm going to be talking about all kinds of different stuff. Kicking it with Keenan in two and a half hours, something like that. Wait, what time is it? I think in an hour, 12 o'clock, whatever time it is now, 45 minutes. Be there right back here. All right, y'all, in a minute. Peace. I'm out.